The Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday of Easter is from Isaiah chapter 40. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might. And because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The epistle is from 1 Peter chapter 2. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should, be, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And the Holy Gospel is taken from the St. John's account, the 16th chapter. Jesus said, A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves, what I meant by saying, A little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Great mercy and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. On this fourth Sunday of Easter, Jubilate Sunday, the text is the Gospel lesson, which was just read from John 16, verses 16 to 22. And the title of my sermon is our crosses give birth to comfort. Let us pray. These are your words, O Heavenly Father. Sanctify us in the truth, for your word is truth. Amen. 
We all know very well the image of Luther's rose, that seal of Luther that is a picture of what the Christian life is promised to be like. A red heart stands in the middle of a white, joyous rose. Here we see faith giving way to joy, comfort, and peace. And this all sounds very, very good. But lest we forget, both the heart and the rose has placed right on top, right in the center, right in the metal, the black cross, the cross of Jesus, the cross of many woes and sufferings and sorrows, sorrows that we too must face in our life. From Good Friday until Easter and then all the way beyond to Pentecost is another picture of what the Christian life is like. From the black cross an extreme sorrow of the disciples, from the weeping and hiding for fear of the Jews, and much worry that filled their hearts while the world, along with others, rejoiced. This gives way to in a little while, on the third day though, Easter joy. Joy increased more with every appearance of Jesus including the ascension at Pentecost, then joy is solidified at the coming of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of those disciples. Jesus says, a little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. The lives of the first disciples were lived by faith born out of sorrow. More sorrow than we certainly will ever have to face because they had witnessed their Messiah taken from them. They had completely lost all faith and all hope because they lost their Messiah, their Savior. But then... In a little while, they saw Jesus again. They saw him alive. They saw him resurrected from the dead. And their sorrow turned to joy. But very soon they realized that their sorrow hadn't ended right there. Their sorrow had really only begun. All the sorrow they would have to face ahead after the Lord ascended into heaven and after Pentecost was much for them to handle, but they handled it with joy in their hearts. Now, we've all probably asked the question ourselves why? Why do we have to go through so much suffering and sorrow as a Christian in our lives? Why didn't it just all end when Jesus accomplished what he came to finish? Well, God's word gives us the answer. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. He says that we who are predestined must be conformed to the image of his son Jesus. Conformed to his likeness. So today we learn how that happens for us in our lives. God gave his only son, Jesus, to suffer on that cross to the point of death. So you also, as his sons and daughters, if you are a true member of Christ's church, must also follow similarly in your life. You must follow in the way of the cross. Another reason is because Jesus loves you. Yes, he loves you, and that's why you must suffer. Because he disciplines you. He chastens you. God the Father chastens you 
as his son also. And this is what God's word says, that the Christian must suffer many tribulations to enter the joy of the kingdom of God, to enter into the presence of the Father, as Jesus goes also to the Father, as he says in our text. Another reason is that over our lifetime, we too must be transformed as we are going through a a transfiguration just like Jesus did. There is a chiseling away at ourselves. There is a, a polishing that goes on in our life. It takes place in the life of the Christian as we are living stones being crafted, being transformed more and more into Christ through the sorrows that we face, the suffering, the many crosses that we must bear. Our baptism into Christ gave birth to our life under the cross and much cross-bearing. And part of this is sorrow over our own sin. Godly sorrow. To recognize our utter failure and failing to keep his law perfectly, falling short of Christ's and God's glory. And also great joy, though, over the new life and faith that we were given as a gift by the Holy Spirit. Luther says, when faith has come into existence, God never fails to thrust the Holy Cross upon our shoulders in order that he may strengthen us and make our faith more vigorous. And so, dear friends, as we bear our crosses for our faith in Jesus, may we realize that God has a greater purpose. And it's not to be mean to you. It's not to be unloving to you. It's not that he is angry with you either. It's rather that he does love you unconditionally. And he desires to humble you. To help you. To kill that old Adam daily. To resist fleshly and worldly lusts and desires. To test your faith to make you cling more to him, to make you not trust in yourself, to not be self-reliant, but instead reliant on God through prayer and meditation upon his word. Crosses and sorrow you must face, but they help you to focus your attention off of this temporary life off of the temporal things in this life and instead focus on the eternal things that are from above. And so one of the greatest sorrows, one of the greatest struggles, one of the greatest griefs that we have to bear in this Christian life that we struggle with daily are the transgressions that we commit repeatedly over and over again. Those ones that we know we shouldn't do, but we keep on doing. We resolve to quit doing them, but then we do it again. So we confess these sins that we commit. We repent of them in sorrow daily. And yet the stronger we grow in our faith, the stronger the sorrow then is over our sin, the realization of it, the realization that I don't want to do this anymore. I want to quit. Repentance then with much sorrow is good and it is godly. On the other hand, the good news of the gospel puts to rest that sorrow in our hearts just as quick as it has risen. And we have great joy in our hearts. Christ is near with his cheer. Never will he leave me. But there are other sorrows we must face 
as Christians in this life. Through various afflictions and tribulations. Some because of the consequences of your past sins and failures. Divorce due to cheating. Jail time due to physically hurting someone. And the list goes on. And yet there are sorrows, sufferings, and crosses that we are called to carry that God sends our way. First, there are spiritual afflictions, trials of our faith. Just like those disciples on Good Friday, and they have that foundation of their faith shaken, we too face not exactly the same thing as they do, but we face similar trials in our life when our faith is shaken. You've had your seasons of doubt, your times of fear, feeling hopeless, things that don't allow you to, to see Jesus clearly before you, or hear his voice through his word? Only agony. Only birth pains and sorrow. And no joy. And yet God wills for our sorrow to be turned into joy. His love shines. It shines through the darkness as he hears our cries of despair and answers us. He reveals his comfort to us through his holy word. And in a little while, the doubts fade, fear subsides, and the face of Jesus appears much more clearly to us once again to comfort us with his peace and joy. Every tribulation we go through is like a new birth. Going through the labor pains all over again so that the new man, the new person may arise in us and go from sorrow to joy once again. Luther says, when you pass through tribulation, be sure never to despair for you are near to glory and will triumph if you but keep the faith. There are also physical afflictions we face, and we can expect many of them in our lifetime. Being broke and unemployed, feeling hopeless as to what to do next, the great physical ailments and chronic sicknesses and diseases that plague our bodies, great suffering, great loss, the agony of tragedy, the loss of life to a house fire, the loss of a whole family in a car accident, a complete city destroyed by a tornado, a friend who dies suddenly at such a young age of a heart attack. We are grief-stricken. We weep and mourn loudly at such sorrow in our lives. And yet through it all, the Lord leads us through these dark valleys as well for just a little while. And then we are reminded by Jesus in a little while, your sorrow will turn to joy. Faith is strengthened as faith is born out of sorrow. Lastly, Luther says, it is impossible for a man to attain to happiness, to joy, unless he has previously suffered pain and sorrow. 
And this is what we must learn as well, dear God's children. Jesus tells us, too, that our sorrow will turn into joy in a little while in the life to come. A day when all suffering, all sorrow, all cross-bearing will end. An eternal joy will come to you. A day when all this will go away. The labored pains will eventually pass away completely and pure, unadulterated joy will be yours. The Christian lives with the joyous expectation of Christ's second and final advent appearing. And this precious hope that each of us have of our salvation complete and finished through this glorious appearing of our Savior is what we look forward to so much. And this is what motivates us. Motivates us, our entire Christian life, to persevere through all of the sorrow that we must face. To be patient, patient, and bearing our crosses and our sufferings. Even, says God's word, to rejoice in our tribulations and thank God for them, realizing that as we suffer, we are suffering with Jesus. We are being conformed more and more to his likeness. As we walk worthily as pilgrims in this life, on our way, our way to heaven, our way to the Father, pointing to the glory which will be revealed in each of us as we see Jesus face to face. And no one will ever take our joy from us. Thanks be to God for Jesus' sake. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.